Hi, 7th grade. Today is Tuesday, and we're going to continue looking at Renaissance arts and compare it to medieval arts. On um, Wednesday, we're going to begin working on Da Vinci. Thursday and Friday, continue Da Vinci. And then you'll have a break. You will have work for me during the break. After the break, we'll have a day or two, maybe a day to review, and then you'll take your assessment. If you have not done your Ed Puzzle videos, I will not release a quiz um, to you if you have not done them. So please make sure to do them. Uh, this quiz, uh, this exit um, was difficult, as you can see by the data. Uh, the goal was for you to have, um, the goal was for you to get at least seven, maybe six, uh, seven. And, um, if you didn't, you know, that's, it's okay. We'll, we'll continue working on this. Now, one thing that I want to focus on is this, um, this question. The question was asking, um, the question was asking, is this, and I moved it to the top, is this image Renaissance or medieval? Um, and you needed to have a, you need to have a claim. You need to have two pieces of evidence, at least two pieces of evidence with an explanation. And here are some of the responses. Okay. And some of them are really, really awesome. So this is a medieval painting. Um, because it lacks realism and it's also religious. You could have said that, or you could have said it lacks perspective and it's religious, or you could have said it lacks realism or, you know, as long as you had two reasons. Um, and then you could have talked about what exactly you see in the image. And I'm going to model that today because I think that was the issue. So most of you did a really good job, but I was concerned about these answers. The ones that said this is medieval. That's not gonna. That's not gonna be enough, right? On your assessment, most of your assessment will be short answers, and if this is what you provide, this won't get you a good grade. Looks weird. It's medieval because it has no sense of perspective. So that's fine. This is a, a claim, but there's no evidence. You need to actually talk about the, the the image itself, medieval, right? That that wasn't. Those answers are not good. So as soon as I saw that your answer was this small, I knew that it wasn't gonna be enough. Okay, so the image is a medieval um, painting because it does lack uh, perspective. Um, it's you could have talked about the background. It lacks a, a um, realistic background. Um, yeah. Okay, moving on. Again, I'm going to show you guys how to do that one today. So, which of the following is most likely a work of art from the Middle Ages? So the Middle Ages. A lot of students got this question wrong. Not wrong, but a lot of students miss one. So this is a medieval painting. Um, this is also medieval, and this is also medieval. If you pick this one, that's incorrect. This is Renaissance and Renaissance. They're much more realistic. And then we're going to get to this one. If a work has perspective, it has a, a depth, depth or 3D, three-dimensional. It has a sense of like background, right? Like a, like a three-dimensional background. Which of the following is true? It's a, a statue. A lot of students miss this one. Which of these is uh, in relief? So in relief means that a statue simply is, uh, on, you can only see it from the front, right? You can't walk around it, right? In relief means that it's attached to the wall. Like this is in relief and this is in relief. It's attached to a wall or it's coming out of a wall, right? It's not freestanding. This is freestanding. You can go around and see all, all parts of the statue. Same thing with this one. So the easiest way to remember is, can I see the back of this statue if I wanted to? Can I go back and look at the back? And the answer is no for this one and no for this one. So it's, if, it's, if it's in relief, it means that you can't um, you can't uh, go to the back and, and, and see all parts of the statue. Uh, next one. Um, which of the following is true about, med uh, about medieval art and sculpture? It's, so 15 students said that medieval art and sculpture is realistic, and that's incorrect, right? 15 students said that it had emotion, and that's incorrect. Medieval uh, sculpture and arts, they lack realism and they lack emotion, and we'll talk about it in a second why. So the biggest one is that medieval arts and sculpture, it's about the message that it's teaching. It's about the, um, the, um, the message that it's um, giving the, the viewer. Uh, 18 students said that nudity was allowed. Again, I think it's a misunderstanding of medieval arts. In medieval art, nudity is not allowed because it's controlled by the church. And then the last one, the correct one, is the background was mostly gold leaf, as you can see from this image, gold leaf. Uh, next question. Oops, sorry. 
uh, Renaissance arts is more secular. More secular means it's less religious. So Renaissance arts, if something is secular, it means it's not religious. So Renaissance art is uh, less religious than medieval arts, right? Does that mean that Renaissance arts is completely secular? No, it's not. Uh, if a painting has perspective, images in the background are smaller, right? As as uh, from the viewer's point of view, as the images, uh, as a person is behind the scenes, that means that the image that that person becomes much smaller, right? Uh, further away from the viewer, the the image is the smaller the object should be. Which of the following uh, are works that Michelangelo took part in? Now, this was really concerning. Okay, let's look at the question. So this is Santa Maria del Fiore. The dome was made by Bruno Leschi, not Michelangelo. We spent a couple of days focusing on this. Bruno Leschi, and this will be part of your break, pack, break work. Bruno Leschi worked on the dome. He developed the dome, right? He is giving credit for developing this dome in Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence. This is the dome that Michelangelo took part in. This is uh, St. Peter's Basilica, the Dome of St. Peter's Basilica. Did he, was he the only one? No, but he was a very influential designer of the dome. So he is given credit for helping design the Dome of St. Peter's Basilica. The Pantheon was made 2,000 years ago, 1,500 years before Michelangelo was around. Notre Dame Cathedral was made in the 11 and 1200s, right? And there is no dome here. Okay. If you picked, if you pick this one, that that's more concerning because there is no dome there. Okay. Um, the exit. I'm gonna go over the exit ticket for the uh, for today for uh, Tuesday, and um, I'll clarify some answers. Okay? okay. So we are gonna go over this entire document. So please pay attention. And you also, we also have a video. The people of the Renaissance. This is very important. It's very similar to um, what we talked about at the beginning of the class. The people during the Renaissance wanted arts that showed human beauty and joy, or human joy and beauty. Humanism, right? Focusing, focusing on the here and now. Renaissance art is more lifelike. Again, it's more realistic. It looks more like real people than the art of the Middle Ages. Take a look at the statues below. What are the biggest differences? So here we have a classical statue. I think this might be from ancient Greece. This is a freestanding, right? Even though there's something here, it's not, you can see it from all angles. You can walk around it. This is focusing on the human body, human power. This is a secular piece. This is a sports person, an athlete. Okay, this is classical. And then we get to the medieval period. These are most likely saints, right? They are in relief. That means that you cannot just go around 360 and walk around and see what they're what what they look like from um from all angles. Okay, and then we go back to the Renaissance, Michelangelo's David, very similar to the classical, right? But also a religious piece. This is a freestanding. Okay, it's freestanding, not in relief. Renaissance artists start study perspective. Perspective is a difference in the way things look when you, they are, are very are close to or or or, or far away okay um and you i'll show you an example in a second the artist uh painted in a way that showed these differences da vinci we're going to be focusing on da vinci tomorrow da vinci was born in 1452 in the village of vinci that's why he's called da vinci leonardo of vinci his name means leonardo of vinci Leonardo began his career working as a master painter in Florence, for a master painter in Florence. By 1478, um, Da Vinci had left his master and set up his own workshop. People have been trying to guess the secret behind his smile on his Mona Lisa. So let's do this one together. So is this a Renaissance or medieval uh, painting, right? That's, and this video is going to be long because it's we're going to have to do this together. Okay, so this painting of the Mona Lisa is a Renaissance painting because it is realistic and secular, right? This is a claim. Now I need to prove it, right? You can clearly see the background in the painting. This demonstrates 
a uh, knowledge of knowledge of perspective or three dimensional paintings during the middle ages did not have perspective okay. this is the bare minimum that you should be giving me right right here we can clearly see the background we can clearly see the background uh, imagery imagery okay this image is also secular this is not a religious person this, this is not a religious person the Mona Lisa, and again, you might need to do some research based on this, right? The Mona Lisa was a, the wife of a rich merchant. Okay. There's a lot more that proves that this is a midi uh, a Renaissance painting. There's the work of, of, of light and, and dark. There's Fumato, which we're going to talk about uh, a little later. Okay. This is the minimum amount that you should give me for, for an explanation, for evidence and explanation. This is the minimum. I could make it much longer, but then this video will take longer, right? But when you just tell me this is medieval or this is Renaissance, not even this is enough. You have to actually tell me, what do you see? What do you notice, right? I could have talked about um, how realistic it looks. She looks like a real person. I could have talked about how she demonstrates emotions. Like the smile, right? You could have talked about um, physically uh, how this looks real. Like this person, whoever painted this, Da Vinci, has a good understanding of the human body, of anatomy. You could have talked about all of that. Okay? His last, so Da Vinci painted this, Renaissance. His last supper shows clearly the difference between Jesus and his followers. Right? This is Jesus. Okay? The Last Supper also shows clear perspective and realism. You're able to see, I'm not able to zoom into this, but you're able to see, maybe I can, you're able to see the background. You see how this background looks like, let me see if I can point to this. You see this background here? You can tell that that background is behind the people, right? Jesus is not... Uh, much, much bigger than the rest of the apostles. You can tell that this is much more realistic. Even though Jesus is the most important character here, in the medieval period, Jesus would have been really, really large. right? Each person looks different. They all have different physical characteristics. Okay. There's also a sense of emotion. This guy showing some emotion. This guy showing some emotion. Right? There's, there's a sense of movement with this guy's hand. There's a lot here that shows that this is a renaissance painting even though it's a religious painting it is still uh very realistic okay uh let me move on from this the place looked like they are on the table there's a sense of perspective here okay the ta the table looks geometrically correct uh, if you remember another painting that I showed you guys about the Middle Ages, the, the, the table looked like the place were going to fall off, right? Not realistic. The viewer can see the background. You're able to see, you see the background right here, the mountains, right? Renaissance tends to have this um, imagery of nature, right? People interacting with nature. There is emotion in the face of the apostles, okay? Again, there's a, reasons, a couple reasons why this is Renaissance. It shows perspective or depth, three-dimensional. It's realistic. Uh, it shows emotion. Okay. Leonardo's fame grew, but not just for painting. Leonardo's going to be one of those people you will have to absolutely know. Uh, Michelangelo and Leonardo are going to be the most important per, uh, people that we're going to focus on. Da Vinci was truly a Renaissance man, meaning he was good at many area, in many areas. He was a scientist and an inventor as well as an artist. So Da Vinci is considered like the ultimate Renaissance man because he was good at many different things. He was a scientist, a painter, a sculptor. Um, he was an inventor. 
He was a scientist and, invent and an inventor, as well as an artist. He made notes and drawings of everything he saw. Uh, one of the things that interests me about Da Vinci was that he studied the tongue of the woodpecker. You might want to look into that. Da Vinci invented clever machines and even designed imitation wings that he hoped would let a person fly like a bird. He drew machines that looked like a tank. Here are some of the examples of the machines that he drew. Now, a lot of these were sketches that were not actually uh, created. But what people say is that, you know, he was 500 years ahead of his time because a lot of these machines actually eventually became uh, real machines. Now, did they become exactly as, as he planned them? Absolutely not. Okay. So these are just machines with using gears. These are uh, wings. This is a helicopter. Um, he He's considered... Some people think that he should be considered a scientist first, right? He was really good at understanding the human body and the human anatomy. He drew many, 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 many sketches. I suggest that you look some of them up. Sketches of how the human body looked, right? He worked with corpses. Uh, corpses are obviously like people that have died. Uh, and and dissected them to see how, how this worked. He was um, one of the earliest people that studied the human hearts like the chambers of the human heart. He was focusing on the hands, uh, the nerves of the hand. Here's the image that I was talking about, the tank. The tank. There's another one that he designed a like a scuba dive, like a scuba dive gear. Um, and eventually that's something that was created. Okay. Okay, so here we're gonna talk a little bit about perspective. So you see how this image is really flat? It looks like it looks like they're all on the same plane, right? Really flat. Jesus, um, Jesus doesn't look much larger than them, right? There's not a lot of emotion, right? It, it, it's it's kind of interesting that the emotion that they're displaying is actually like happiness, right? Um, and this is one of the first examples of linear perspective. You're able to see, you're able to see the perspective here. You see that where the happy face is? You see how it's like a tunnel? Uh, let me clear that bad boy. Okay, um, you're able to see that these people here, you're able to see that these people are in front of these people, right? That's perspective. When you're able to tell who's in front and who's behind, that's, that's, that's pretty much what perspective is, the sense of depth, the sense of background, the sense of three dimensions. Okay, that is perspective. If you were struggling with that, okay. Okay, moving on. So think about this one. Which one is medieval? It tells you here. This is medieval Gothic. And this is Renaissance. Look at the size of the Virgin Mary here versus the size of the Virgin Mary here. Right. Uh, obviously, there's less people here, so you really can't compare. But if the Virgin Mary got got up she'll be much taller than the angels right the virgin mary is the most important that's why she's made the largest there's also this sense of um of perspective here you see how these angels look that they're all kind of standing on each other's heads right the there's a a, a lack of of depth or three dimensions right uh also jesus is way too big jesus does not look like a like a real like a real baby now Compare that to the to this side. There's a couple of reasons that the one on the right is is Renaissance. One, there's perspective. There's this background in the back, right? So that you could talk about perspective. You could talk talk about how the buildings in the back look smaller than the people that are closer to the viewer. Okay, you could talk about um, the emotion. On the face of the of the of the Virgin Mary, you could have talked about. You can talk about how um, the baby looks like a baby, right? It's re it's realistically it realistically looks like a baby, right? You can even you can talk about the hands. Um, you can talk about even her neck. You can talk about how this is a realistic uh, image because it follows the the rules of anatomy, right? This does not follow the rules of anatomy. Okay. This also has nudity in it. Okay. And even though it's it's a child, that still counts as a nudity. Okay. So again, medieval and Renaissance. Medieval art was more focused on religion. 
than Renaissance art was. Statues, medieval statues often look very stiff and often did not appear to be very much, there, there didn't appear to be have very much movement. Subjects of the medieval period were being painted often. They look flat and emotionless. Again, flat with a, with a lack of emotion. They often did not look very realistic. Bright colors were used in paintings. You see the bright color in the back, the gold leaf. But there was usually not very many colors involved in the paintings. Basically, the purpose, the pur purpose, the purpose of medieval art was to teach religion to those who did not know how to read or write. Again, medieval art was mostly to teach a message. Here's another example. Again, I'll, I'll, you'll have you have a chance to prove that you understand what I'm I'm talking about. Da Vinci um, was a master painter. There's this technique called chiaroscuro, which was developed in the Renaissance. And chiaroscuro refers to light and dark, like the smokiness. And there's also sfumato, again, the smokiness. Um, think about why this is Renaissance and what makes this, uh, I'm sorry, what makes this Renaissance? I keep saying Renaissance. What makes this medieval? This one. And what makes this Renaissance? Again, the one on the left is religious. The one on the right is secular. The one on the left lacks perspective. The one on the right has perspective in the back. Right? The one on the left is not does not show much emotion. The one on the right shows emotion. Right? Okay, moving on. So I'm going to go over this pretty quickly, okay? So this is Renaissance art. The one on the left is Renaissance art. Uh, increased emphasis on secular themes, so not just religion. They're definitely influenced by the uh, by the Greeks and the Romans. They use perspective. Chiaroscuro, you might want to find out what that is. Let me know. Uh, but chiaroscuro, I hope you. Are, it, it has to do with with the smokiness of the of the painting. Uh, they use more bright colors. They have more emotion in art. Real people and settings depict us so real people, not just angels and or God. So this is a big one. Patrons, so the people that are painting for art are not just, it's not just the church, right? It's people that are very wealthy, like the Medici family. Okay? So, but that does not mean that the Pope disappears. The Pope is still really important. Church is still really important. In the medieval, Gothic style, Byzantine style, we're going to focus on that. But it's mostly totally religious. Uh, statues tend to be stiff and one-dimensional, no sense of perspective. They lack emotion. A lot of it is gold uh, background. They lack lack perspective or depth. Lack of chiaroscuro, which is a um, light and dark sh uh, shading. And patrons was mostly the church. The church is mostly paying for arts. Okay. So this is a uh, a painting done by uh, Filippo Lippi, Madonna and Child with Two Angels. So think about what makes this a Renaissance or medieval painting. This is a Renaissance painting, right? Let's go over the, the details. So we your claim could be this is a Renaissance painting because it's realistic and shows emotion. Or this is a Renaissance painting because it has depth and it's realistic. Or you can do a combination of many things, right? Uh, the big one is the background. There's a sense of perspective, right? It's in nature. That's another big one for Renaissance. Um, here we have emotion. Even the wings, you can tell that the wings are behind the little angel, right? Okay. Um, this is a religious piece. So you have to be careful. You cannot say this is a Renaissance painting because it's religious and secular because that's incorrect. I'm sorry, it's, it has perspective and it's secular. You can't say that, right? Um, because that's incorrect. This is a religious piece. This is the, the Virgin Mary with, with, with the baby Christ and an angel. Um, okay, moving on. I don't want to make this video too long. So take a second to tell me why this might be a medieval, medieval painting or Renaissance painting. This is called Madonna and Child by Duccio. Uh, 1284. So this will be an Ed Puzzle. Um, it might be multiple choice. Remember this Remember this painting. I'm not going to go into it right now, but remember this painting. It's called, um, it's something to do with wedding. 
um, but remember this painting. You will need to know this painting for sure. Okay, let's go over these two. How do you recognize Italian Renaissance art? Sometimes we use the word Renaissance to talk about the revival of something generally, but in art history, Renaissance means something very specific. It means the rebirth of the culture of ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Which we call the classical period or classical antiquity. Let's start at the very end of the medieval. And that's a good place to start because it gives us a sense of what the Renaissance is going to do differently. So let's start with this beautiful stained glass window from Chartres Cathedral. This was a very important cathedral in the medieval period and it's extremely famous for its stained glass. And one of its most famous windows is known as the Blue Virgin. So this is a Gothic cathedral. In the center is the Virgin Mary. She's seated on a throne, and the young Christ child is seated on her lap. So we need to figure out if this is Renaissance or medieval, right? Uh, it happened in the 1200s, so it automatically tells you that it's medieval. Now start thinking about what makes it, what are some of the characteristics that make it medieval? Because we've talked about painting on, uh, on different surfaces. We have not talked about paintings on stained glass as much, okay? So think about it. Both of the figures are frontal, and that's a pose that is very static. It gives us a sense of the divine. We move our bodies in space. We are rarely seen from a perfectly frontal view. So as soon as a figure is represented in a frontal way, there's a sense of authority, a sense of the eternal. There's a formality. This is not meant to portray real people. This is meant to portray the Virgin Mary and the Christ child in a heavenly sphere. And in fact, we see above them a representation of a dove and that's a symbol of the holy spirit the holy spirit being one part of the three-part nature of god we also see that the figure of the virgin especially if she were to stand up her body would be so long there's no concern with the naturalistic rendering of the proportions of the human body so again that goes back to realism right her body is not realistic to what um a person actually looks like but one of my favorite aspects is that you have this very large virgin and child in the center. And then you have these rather small angels that are framing them on either side. A hierarchy is expressed here between the angels and the Madonna and the Christ child, telling us that they're more important than the angels on either side of them. So, let's so again, go back to that idea that whoever is, is more, most important, they tend to be the biggest. Let's now look at a painting, a fresco, by Giotto. We're now in Italy. We're in a town named Padua, and we're looking at... So this is a little later, right? So this is kind of the beginning of the Renaissance. So you will start to see some Renaissance ideas in, in these paintings. At one scene in a complex series of scenes painted on the walls of a private chapel, which is usually called the Arena Chapel or sometimes the Scrovani Chapel. So we've shifted to a smaller family chapel, and this tells us something about how patronage is shifting at the very end of the Middle Ages. We have more individuals who are accumulating wealth, and they spend their money often on religious works of art, on family chapels apples to help to ensure their place in heaven. But it also helped to ensure his social position. So this is a private chapel, so it's most likely by a rich, wealthy family that wants to have their own chapel. So more private uh, patrons, not just the church. On earth. Scrivani was a banker, his father had been a banker, and they hired one of the most prominent artists of the era, Giotto, to paint a fresco cycle. Now, Giotto came from the city of Florence, and every artist that we'll look at in the remainder of this video will be associated with Florence, which is often seen as the birthplace of the Renaissance. So let's look closely at the Lamentation. This is after Christ has been crucified, his body has been removed from the cross, he's being held, mourned by his mother Mary in an incredibly emotional moment, surrounded by the apostles' work. So before they go into it, I want you to start thinking about what makes this an early Renaissance painting, right? Uh, do you see emotion, right? Do you see perspective? Is there other colors besides gold leaf? So let's talk with emotion first. Uh, there's emotion here, there's emotion here, there's emotion here, there's sadness, right? There's perspective, you can look, look at this stone, you can tell that this is behind this, right? Uh, let me see if I can do this. 
you can tell that this area is behind this area, right? You can tell that the angels are in the back somewhere. There's a sense of motion. There's a sense of movement with the angels. And, and another big one was the sense of realism. Jesus is not this giant who's, who's much bigger than everyone else, right? Everyone's kind of the same size. also mourning his death. So a number of important changes. First of all, we have emotion. We have emotion in the face of Mary and in the tender way in which she holds her now dead son. We have emotion in the angels. But I think even more importantly, we've lost the frontality that we saw at Chart. We have figures from profile view, three-quarter view. We have figures that are seen from behind. This is much more the way we would really see a group of people. By using modeling, Giotto is able to create figures who take up space. When you use the term modeling, or we could use the Italian word chiaroscuro, we're talking about the creation of an illusion on a flat surface of something that is rounded, something that takes up space. And if you look at the backs of these figures, you see how the cloth is light in certain places and shadowed in certain places. The figures seem to take up space. They have a sense of mass and volume. He's also using that light and dark to call attention to the forms of the body underneath the drapery. So for example, Mary Magdalene, who's seated at the feet of Christ, we see her knee pressing through the drapery. We see the beginnings of an interest in the human body. One other important change is that we're now in a landscape. At Chart, we were in a heavenly sphere. We had this marvelous red background. But here we see a bit of a hill, we see a tree, we see a sky. What we're seeing is an increased interest in placing Christ on earth. So we're going to move from the early 1300s to the middle of the 1400s, to a period that art historians usually call the early Renaissance. Now, the image that we saw at Chart was stained glass. The Giotto was fresco, that is, it was painted directly on the wall. This is different. This is a piece of wood, and on that, the artist has painted with tempera, pigment that is suspended in egg yolk. Tempera. So we're thinking about what makes this uh, Renaissance. We talked about it a little bit, but they're going to talk about it as well on wood means that the artist has created something that is movable. This is something that can be bought and sold. This is by Fra Filippo Lippi, and we see again the Virgin Mary. Even though her hands are in prayer, she seems more like an earthly mother, and those angels seem much more like little boys than they seem like angels. In fact, they even look mischievous. And the Christ child seems more like a baby. Lippi's facility with naturalism is evident. We want to believe the truthfulness of these figures. In fact, they seem to literally come out of the frame into our space. And I just want to call our attention to that word naturalism. It means like nature, truthful. And we see it not only in this increasing ability to render something that seems believable, but also in the landscape beyond. We see a convincing representation of depth. And that's represented by diminishing scale, as well as something that we call atmospheric perspective. That is, as things go back in space, they become lighter and their colors become less intense. But these are all formal qualities. Why are artists interested in this kind of naturalism? We have an increasing number of families in Florence who are accumulating vast amounts of wealth, and people want to enjoy their earthly life. And one of the things that they do is commission works of art. And works of art become a signal for somebody's social status. Although these are religious paintings, we are still looking at a culture that is deeply religious. And we see the conflation of those issues in this painting. Here we have tremendous naturalism, a tremendous interest in the anatomy of the human body, in human emotion, human intimacy. But at the same time, this is the Christ child. This is the Virgin Mary. Let's move now to a period art historians call the High Renaissance. And the artists there are Michelangelo, Leonardo, and Raphael. This is the creation of Adam from the center of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Michelangelo is a artist from Florence, but he's been called to Rome by the Pope. So what are the formal characteristics of the High Renaissance? For me, it is an extraordinary understanding of the anatomy of the human body. 
of its skeletal structure, of its musculature, and a direct focus on the beauty of the human form. There's this new interest in the graceful movement of the human body, making that body move through space in an incredibly graceful and elegant way. And in increasingly complex ways as well. We see God on the right, who seems to be moving with great velocity. His arm reaches out. His other arm, however, moves back around another. So this is, we focus a lot on this already. Think of the human anatomy, right? You can see his kneecaps. You can see his feet. You can see the bones that make up his body, right? Um, so this is a real, real representation of the understanding of the human body anatomy. Their figure, we see his legs are crossed his face is in profile but his chest is forward we have not only this careful articulation of the body but we have that body in the most complex poses and the same could be said of adam his right arm comes back and his right shoulder moves back his left shoulder moves forward his head tilts back as he looks toward his creator this is an expression of the beauty and love of the body in the high renaissance We've been talking about the elegance and the complexity of God and of Adam, but we could also say that that complexity extends to groupings of figures. So we see those angels who surround God. They twist, they turn, they lean forward to see what God has created. We have this complex interaction between the figures and layering of the figures that is also very high Renaissance. So where do you go after Michelangelo's? We'll stop there for that one. Here's your exit ticket for Mon uh, for Tuesday. So, um, so if a work has perspective, some of these questions are the same as the ones from the from from last week. So, because we did review it, if a work has perspective. Okay, which of the following is in relief? So remember what the word in relief means. Which of the following is true about medieval art and sculpture? Okay, again, when you see these boxes, it has multiple answers. If a, if a painting has perspective, it means Renaissance art is. So some of these questions are very similar. I've just changed the language a little bit. Okay, which of the following is true about the uh, following image? So wh which of these is true about this one? So there's five answers here, and you have to get all five of them right to be able to get the points. Uh, which of the following are works that Michelangelo uh, do or take part in? Which of these did he work on? Who, who drew these images? Who drew these images? And then we get to this one. Identify the following image as medieval or Renaissance work. You must provide two to three pieces of evidence. So here you must have at least two with two. You must have two reasons here. I should. I'm gonna change it up. You must have two reasons and support it with evidence. The evidence is what you observe. You cannot simply say this is medieval or this is Renaissance and the story. You have to give me two reasons, like I did in, in class today, and then tell me the evidence that you have, what evidence you have to support those two reasons. Actually, tell me what you observe. What is it that you see in the painting that proves your points? Okay. Uh, your goal is to get, um, I believe there's 10 questions, 11, uh, 11 points. Your goal is to get eight or higher. Uh, we're going to be moving that number up because it's it's getting closer to the assessments. Uh, I was going to show you guys this one's called the Adoration of the Mag Magi, uh, but I'm going to put that off to Wednesday. If you want to take a look at it, you're more than welcome to begin working on that. Um, again, on Tuesday, we're doing art. Wednesday, we're doing Da Vinci. Thursday, we're doing Da Vinci. Friday, we're going to summarize Da Vinci and art. And then after the break, during the break, you will have work. Uh, you will most likely be assigned this uh, documentary. is called uh, Godfathers of the Renaissance. It's in YouTube, and it has to do with the Medici family. It's a pretty long documentary, but you will you got this. After this, uh, I'm still debating. You might get an essay from me, uh, an argumentative essay on who is more of a Renaissance man, Da Vinci or Michelangelo. But um, that's still up in the air. I will see you guys soon. Please stay safe. I'll see you guys later. Bye.